Good afternoon, everybody. Hope you all enjoyed some uh, uncharacteristically springtime weather in Washington this weekend. I know I did. Um, I don't have any announcements to get us started, so uh, let's go straight to your questions. Thanks, Josh. I'd like to get your response to the letter that um, uh, Senate Republicans sent to Iranian leaders. Um, does the president fear that this letter could um, threaten the talks at this very delicate stage? Well, Nidra, I would describe this letter as uh, the continuation of a partisan strategy to undermine the president's ability to conduct foreign policy and advance our national security interests around the globe. The fact is the uh, effort that is currently underway by the United States alongside our international partners seeks significant commitments from the Iranian government to curtail their nuclear program to and make clear to the international community that their nuclear program exists exclusively for peaceful means. And the international community, and certainly the president, is not prepared to take uh, Iran's word for it. We're going to insist that the uh, Iranians agree to intrusive inspection measures that will resolve the broader international community's concerns. And uh, as uh, the National Security Advisor put it, uh, the approach of the international community is to distrust and verify that Iran is prepared to live up to the uh, agreement. And uh, the fact is we have heard Republicans now for quite some time, including the principal author of this letter, make clear that their goal is to undermine these negotiations. Uh, and again, that is not something, that is not a position I am ascribing to Senator Cotton. That is a position that he has strongly advocated. He described it as a feature of his strategy, not a bug. And um, the fact is that the president is trying to explore this diplomatic option with Iran and alongside our international partners because it is in the best interest of the United States for two reasons. The first is the best way for us to resolve the international community's concerns with Iran's nuclear program is to get Iran's own commitment to not develop a nuclear weapon and to verify that for the broader international community. And the rush to war, or at least the rush to the military option that many Republicans are advocating, uh, is not at all in the best interest of the United States. Could this um, have the effect of advancing their goal of trying to thwart these talks? Does it make it harder to reach a deal? Well, it certainly is. Uh, it certainly interferes uh, in that effort. The fact that there are ongoing negotiations um, with, again, with the United States, our P5 plus one partners uh, that include our stalwart allies like Germany and France and the UK, but also include our partners like uh, Russia and China who are cooperating with us in this effort that to uh, you know, essentially so throw sand in the gears here uh, is not helpful and uh, is not frankly a, uh, the role that our founding fathers envisioned for Congress to play when it comes to foreign policy. Why should a deal be considered a treaty that Congress should be able to weigh on? Well, Nedra, this is a useful, um, a useful discussion. That what we are seeking from Iran are a whole set of commitments from them that are related to uh, uh, commitments to rein in the aspirations of their nuclear program and to submit, commit to comply with uh, an intrusive set of inspections to verify their compliance with the agreement. What we are seeking are we're seeking commitments from the Iranian government. This is not that different than the kind of commitments that we seek from other countries when we establish basing agreements with them. So currently there are U.S. military personnel that are serving in places like Korea and Japan. We have uh, commitments from the Japanese government and the Korean government, for example, about what sort of rules and regulations will govern the U.S. military presence there. That's an important agreement that has a substantial impact on the ability of our men and women in uniform to do their jobs and to do their jobs safely. But that is not an agreement that's subjected to congressional approval. That's a, that is a, uh, those are specific commitments that the, uh, that Iran, that in that, in that situation that Korea and Japan have uh, made. There are other examples. The agreement uh, that was put in place to eliminate Syria's chemical weapons program was uh, the United States and Russia working with Syria to get Syria to make some specific commitments about dismantling their chemical weapons program. That is not an agreement uh, that required congressional uh, participation or approval, but it was a tangible 
set of commitments that were uh, made by the Syrian government. And the United States and, and Russia and a number of other countries in the international community worked with us to uh, succeed in that effort. Let me give you uh, one other example. There are also a, a variety of other multilateral agreements that relate to nonproliferation. So there are some direct um, similarities between this agreement that the P5 plus one is currently negotiating with Iran uh, and other agreements that uh, ensure or prevent the proliferation uh, of weapons and in some cases nuclear weapons. The best example of this is that there is a multilateral agreement that is related to interdicting uh, weapons uh, in international waters and that we work closely with the international community to uh, prevent the shipment of uh, illicit, illicit weapons shipments uh, through international waters. And we work with other countries to enforce those uh, uh, agreements and to secure commitments from other countries that they're going to help us fight those efforts. Again, that is a, a multilateral agreement that has significant consequences for American national security that doesn't require congressional approval. And this is the way that our founding fathers envisioned that the, the, that the executive branch would be responsible for uh, protecting the foreign policy interests of the United States. One uh, related question. The, uh, uh, many news organizations on Friday reported that Senator Menendez is about to face criminal charges. And you had um, Senator Cruz suggesting that they would be political retribution from the White House for his opposition to the Iran talks. Can you respond to that? Well, I have uh, seen those reports. Uh, those reports were not confirmed by the Justice Department, so we don't know at this point uh, exactly uh, whether or not they're true. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm not going to uh, comment on them principally for that reason. But there's another, because we don't yet know whether it's, this is true. The other reason that I uh, am loath to co comment on this is that there is a principle that this administration takes very seriously, which is ensuring that criminal prosecutions are kept separate and apart from uh, any sort of political interference, even the appearance of political interference. So um, that both explains why I'm not in a position to comment on the specific story, but it also serves to undermine the claims that are made by a number of people, including uh, apparently Senator Cruz. Okay. Julia. Thanks. Um, so President Obama is meeting with European Council President uh, Tusk today. And Tusk has indicated that Europe's not ready to tighten sanctions on Russia. Um, is the U.S. prepared to go it alone? Should it beef up sanctions on Russia and take other measures? Um, and are you waiting to see what happens with the current ceasefire in Ukraine? Uh, the, the President is pleased to uh, have the opportunity to be visiting with President Tusk this, uh, today here at the White House. Uh, it is an opportunity for us to discuss a range of issues, including uh, the coordinated international effort uh, to confront Russia over the situation in Ukraine. Uh, they'll also have an opportunity to talk about the transatlantic trade and investment partnership. They'll also talk about things like energy security and climate change and even the situation in Libya. So they have a pretty uh, long agenda. I would anticipate that they'll have a discussion about the uh, ongoing strategy with respect to Russia and Ukraine. Um, I don't have any uh, additional announcements to make at this point about sanctions that may be contemplated uh, on the part of the United States. Uh, obviously, we have continued to watch the uh, sort of uneven implementation of the Minsk implementation plan. There uh, you know, have been reports that uh, we heavy weapons have been withdrawn, but we continue to be concerned uh, about Russia. Uh, and the behavior of the separatists that they back, that uh, most specifically uh, Russia and those separatists have prevented uh, OSCE monitors from getting full access to contested areas to verify compliance with the Minsk implementation plan. That continues to be the subject of significant uh, concern. Uh, and it represents a failure of Russia and the, their, the separatists that they back to live up to the terms of the agreement. So we continue to have uh, concerns about that. And as long as Russia and the separatists that they back continue to engage in that kind of behavior, they're only increasing the likelihood that they could face uh, additional isolation and have additional costs imposed on them by the international community. We have sought from the beginning uh, to work closely in coordination with our European partners to ratchet up that pressure. Uh, and uh, we're going to continue to uh, coordinate those efforts in the days ahead. 
Okay, also, uh, the CBO just made another downward revision um, to the estimates of insurance costs under Obamacare. Um, yeah, so why else, please to see this as, as the Supreme Court uh, ways of pending decision that, that could bring down the curtain on Obamacare? Yeah, well, it certainly is a, uh, only the latest in a long line of uh, data points that indicate the Affordable Care Act is contributing in a very positive way to holding down the growth of health care costs in this country in a way that has very real economic benefits, not just for middle class families across the country, but also for uh, businesses large and small. And you know, one, of the, uh, you know, one of the goals here has been to recognize that the unrestrained growth in health care costs did pose a threat to uh, governments, our government's finances but also did uh, contribute to some weakness in our economy. And that over the long term, getting a handle uh, on those trends uh, is important and was one of the goals of the Affordable Care Act. And we're pleased to see that even just after uh, a couple of years of being in effect, that the, uh, that the impact is both noticeable and positive. Okay. All right, Michelle. Um, on this letter now, there's some reaction coming from uh, Democratic senators and others calling uh, the Iran letter cynical, brazen, that it weakens America's hand, that it could sabotage things. I mean, they're using pretty strong terms. And you just said that it interferes. Does it put the U.S. in a weaker position for negotiating? Could this letter hurt that process? Well, uh, Michelle, as I mentioned, I think at the very top, this is only the latest in a ongoing partisan strategy to undermine the president's ability to conduct foreign policy and to advance our national security interests around the globe. I do think that it does that. And, uh, you know, I think the other thing that is notable here is when you have uh, a letter that is signed by 47 senators of the same party being sent to the leader of another country, it raises, I think, some legitimate questions about the intent of those who signed the letter. So you're saying that it could harm the negotiations. I just want to be clear. Well, again, I think the fact that there are ongoing uh, diplomatic conversations, now, again, not just between the United States and Iran, but between the United States and our P5 plus one partners, that includes our allies like Germany and France and the UK, uh, but also includes our partners like Russia and China. These are nations with whom we have some significant disagreements, but who uh, in this case are working closely with the United States uh, because they agree that there are significant benefits associated with reaching a diplomatic agreement here. And, uh, you know, it's surprising to me that there are some Republican senators who are seeking to establish a back channel with hardliners in Iran to undermine an agreement between Iran and the broader international community does threaten the negotiations in some way? Well, I, again, I, I think I've said this as uh, probably as, as many ways as I can at this point. <laughs> I'm still not sure, but, but you're saying that what you said stands. Or are you saying that it could threaten the negotiations? Well, I, I, you keep using the same word. I've okay. used lots of different words. Okay. I use one of mine <laughs> to describe. Uh, okay. So um, over the weekend, okay, so you're also talking about how, how much you're asking for for from Iran on the, all of these commitments. Mm -hmm. But then again, over the weekend, we heard the president say in an interview that the agreement would be extraordinarily reasonable for Iran. Um, mm -hmm. Can you sort of give us some, some balance there? Yeah, the context that the, that the president was making is if you assume that when Iran says their nuclear program is exists solely for peaceful purposes, that should be an easy thing for them to demonstrate. Now, there are all sorts of reasons why we doubt those previous claims. But the point of the president is that uh, as Iran is evaluating this agreement, if they're willing to live up to their commitment to have their nuclear program exist for only peaceful, for peaceful purposes, then it should, that should be a relatively easy thing to demonstrate. Now, they're going to have to demonstrate it. They're going to have to uh, agree with to uh, a set of very intrusive inspections, principally because in the past uh, they have uh, explored some covert um, strategies for uh, developing a nuclear weapon. Um, but again, 
if your frame of reference is Iran's commitment to a peaceful nuclear program, there should be a reasonable way for them to demonstrate that. And uh, that is the point that the, that the president is making. The concern that the president and the international community has is that uh, Iran's behavior in the recent past has not been consistent with their promises uh, of a peaceful nuclear program, which is precisely why uh, any sort of agreement that is reached will require serious commitments on the part of Iran to an intrusive inspections program that allows international inspectors not just into their nuclear facilities, but also into the manufacturing facilities that are manufacturing uh, parts and equipment for their nuclear facilities that would require inspections at uh, uranium mines uh, in, uh, in Iran to ensure uh, that we have a, a lot of insight into their program, essentially to prevent them from being in a position uh, of establishing another covert strategy for developing a nuclear weapon. And again, I guess the last point is, all of this is much more likely to be successful and more enduring than the military option that our Republican opponents seem to be advocating. Just when you said that it was extraordinarily reasonable, is the extraordinary part, is that in the time frame given or the fact that they're able to continue with their uh, nuclear program for peaceful means, is that, is that what would be extraordinary about the reasonableness of the negotiation? Well, I, I think the, the point that the President uh, made in the course of that interview is to demonstrate that if Iran is interested in a genuinely peaceful nuclear program, uh, that that is something that they should be able to both agree to, but also agree to prove to the international community that that essentially um, should be something that's easy for them to demonstrate and therefore um, should be something that they would agree to. Now, the fact of the matter is, this is not something that Iran has been honest about in the past. And that is part of why this is uh, such an important uh, strategy for resolving the international community's concerns with their nuclear program. That a military option uh, is one that would be less effective, principally because it would not be as enduring in terms of the impact that it would have. Uh, but also, you know, if a military option were deployed, it's not hard to imagine that Iran would say, well, we're, why are, we're not going to agree to these inspections any longer. Uh, and that means the international community would only have less insight into what's happening with Iran's nuclear program. That's why a negotiated diplomatic solution is one that uh, doesn't require uh, the kind of military commitment that some of our opponents seem to be advocating. It does ensure greater transparency into Iran's nuclear program, and it's one that's likely to last longer. That a military option would set back their program, but for, far, but for only a fraction of the time than the length of the diplomatic agreement that's currently being negotiated. Okay, and Leslie, um, on Iraq, over the weekend, we, we also heard officials practically begging the coalition to help protect antiquities and asking why, if, if the coalition can target an individual tank or an individual building, why they couldn't do more to protect Nimrud, I mean, a, a, as ISIS was practically bulldozing the place. Uh, is this something that, that concerns the president, concerns the administration, why those couldn't be protected? Well, I, I guess for the kinds of tactical decisions that are being made, uh, as it relates to the use of military air power, I'd refer you to the Department of Defense. They're, in the, they're the ones that are in a position to uh, decide how those, alloc uh, how those resources should be properly allocated. Okay. Olivier. Uh, a couple for you. You listed a number of international commitments that did not go to a vote in, in Congress. Can I just be clear, do you regard the, the corporate legislation as unnecessary or actually undesirable? Uh, I guess what I would say is that the kind of commitments that we are seeking to extract from the Iranians alongside our international partners is not one that falls in the realm of, uh, of requiring congressional approval on the front end. Now, what is important about this, and this is another aspect of our position that is routinely distorted by our opponents, the administration has long worked closely with Congress in this effort. Right? You'll recall that several years ago when Congress put in place uh, tough sanctions against Iran, that the administration worked with them as they did that. The President signed that bill in, into law. 
And the president and his team then implemented a diplomatic strategy to maximize the impact of the sanctions that Congress had passed. So you did see effective coordination and cooperation between the administration and Congress in that effort. Since then, you have seen the administration go to great lengths to work closely with Congress to keep them in the loop on the status of ongoing negotiations. That's taken place in a variety of settings. Uh, the President of the United States, for goodness sakes, has even had senior members of Congress here to talk to, him, talk to them about those conversations directly. And we have always envisioned a role for Congress at some point uh, in terms of uh, essentially um, uh, uh, taking the sanctions away once we have seen demonstrated compliance on the part of Iran to the agreement. And I think this is in some ways where the difference is. Congress is insisting, well, that they should have a vote on the sanctions regime and on the deal uh, shortly after an agreement is reached at the negotiating table. But that's not what the president en envisions. The fact is the president does not envision substantial uh, sanctions relief for Iran right at the negotiating table. We want to see dem a demonstrated commitment on Iran's part to living up to the agreement before we contemplate um, offering relief from the sa statutory sanctions regime that Congress has put in place. Uh, and I'm not just talking about over the course of weeks or months. I'm talking about years. We would want to see Iran demonstrate its commitment to this agreement for years before we would envision a scenario where Congress would take away the sanctions that were so uh, important to getting Iran to the negotiating table in the first place. So there is a, a robust and important role for Congress to play. There has been in the past, there is right now, and there will be in the future. But what Congress should not do, uh, and frankly what uh, Republicans in Congress should not do, is continue to pursue a partisan strategy to undermine the talks before a deal has even been reached. Okay, and then um, you accused uh, Republicans in Congress are trying to create a back, back channel to hard liners, hard liners in Iran. Um, it's an open kind of ironic, isn't it? Well, it's kind of weird because it's an open uh, letter yeah. to the leadership of Iran. I mean, unless you have evidence of a secret effort to enlist these folks behind, that's what a back channel is. It's not a press release that's labeled to the leaders of Iran. Well, so. I guess the reason that I call it maybe it's a direct channel. Uh, I, I'm not as familiar with the diplomatic speak as you might be. But it is a little ironic that, well, I don't, I don't, and I don't mean that as a criticism. It just reflects your, uh, your experience is different than mine. The point is, what we have seen is we have seen uh, a bunch of Republicans in Congress, at least some of whom have previously criticized the president for engaging with Iran in the first place, now writing a letter to the leadership of Iran suggesting that they should uh, withdraw, withdraw or at least not participate in talks with the broader international community about their nuclear program. This is why I think it raises significant questions about the intent or the aims of the letter's authors, because it does um, undermine the president's ability uh, to represent our foreign policy interests around the globe and advance our national security interests. And uh, it does raise questions about what their strategy actually is. If they're trying to undermine this agreement and not uh, allow a diplomatic resolution to be uh, arrived at, then they should just be, A, they should be honest about that. They'll, you know, the letter is couched in all these terms about pr trying to provide a civics lesson to Iran's political leadership. But the fact is they're against a deal. If they're so ashamed of that position, why wouldn't they advocate it publicly? And if they do, if they do advocate that a diplomatic agreement is not the right approach, then they should explain what the right approach is. The fact is the only other alternative that anybody else has put on the, on the table is a military option. And the fact is this Republican track record of putting military options ahead of diplomatic options has a uh, long and rather sordid history. Mara. Um, a message to Iran that no matter what they do, the sanctions aren't going to be lifted by this Congress. <laughs> well, I, I, again, the letter, I, I, I don't know if I brought out the letter. I guess I did. Um, well, I, mean, I think the message, the message they're right? delivering is one that's, as Olivier yeah. pointed, is, in, is an open letter. So yeah. I guess you can ask them about the message they're trying to send. I can talk to you about the impact that it's going to have. Well, you're saying there is, the Congress isn't necessary to approve the deal, but, they, but you did say they are necessary to lift the sanctions. Yes. Yes, and that, but that is a scenario that we would envision only after years of demonstrated compliance with the agreement. There is, the President does not believe it's a good idea 
right after reaching the deal with Iran, particularly given their history uh, of noncompliance with international standards, that it doesn't make a lot of sense to take away right away uh, essentially the, the toughest uh, weapon that we've used so far. That by putting in place these statutory sanctions that Congress passed several years ago, we did succeed in putting enormous pressure on the Iranian economy. Now, a lot of that, again, is thanks to the good work of this administration that worked with the uh, international community to maximize the impact of those sanctions. But we saw that oil exports plummeted in Iran, that Iran's currency uh, was significantly devalued, uh, that, there, um, that there are a whole host of negative economic impacts that they have sustained as a result of this international uh, isolation. And in the mind of the president, we should make sure that Iran is serious about living up to the terms of this agreement over a number of years before we contemplate taking those sanctions away. So you're saying no sanction relief for many, many years? Uh, what I'm suggesting is that there is, we should not take down, we should not dismantle our sanctions architecture until Iran has, over the course of a number of years, demonstrated a willingness to comply with an international agreement. Justin? Um, we made about 20 minutes, so I wanted to go back to your favorite topic from last week, which is Secretary Clinton's emails. Great. <laughs> uh, we heard from the President uh, in his interview with CBS about this, and he said that he first became aware of it uh, in news reports last week. So I'm wondering if implicit in that is that the President and Secretary, Cl Secretary Clinton never emailed one another when uh, Secretary Clinton was, was serving at the State Department. Uh, that, that may be one conclusion uh, to draw from the President's remarks, but it would not be an accurate one. Uh, the President, as I think many people expected, did, over the course of his first several years in office, trade emails with his Secretary of State. Uh, I would not describe the number of emails as uh, large, uh, but they did have the occasion to email one another. And the point that the President was making is not that he didn't know Secretary Clinton's email address. He did. Uh, but. Uh, he was not aware of the details of um, how that email address and that server had been set up uh, or how uh, Secretary Clinton and her team uh, were planning to comply with the Federal Records Act. Just to so, drill down on that a little bit, does that mean that he didn't know that he was emailing whatever it was, like HRC at clintonemail.com or that, yeah? Well, again, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail here, but I'm not going to uh, – the point is the President did email with Secretary Clinton. I assume that he recognized the email that he recognized the email address that he was emailing back to. Um, but again, the question here is uh, about compliance with the Federal Records Act. And uh, the understandably, the kinds of things that our President and his Secretary of State talk about um, are pretty weighty national issues. I'm not sure that they drilled all the way down to, uh, the Federal Records Act. Uh, but what is clear is that, uh, as the President said in his interview, is that the emails that he sends uh, are properly maintained consistent with the Presidential Records Act. Uh, and that, by the way, would be true of any emails that he received from his Secretary of State. So, um, and the reason I raise that is because Secretary Clinton's team has pointed out, rightfully so, that a large number of the emails that they uh, provided to the State Department in response to a request from her personal email system uh, were already maintained on the State Department agency uh, system. And the reason for that is she was emailing people with uh, State Department employees with state.gov email addresses, which meant, which meant that those email communications had been properly preserved and maintained. Uh, the last thing I'll say about this is that you know, what we know also is that the whole purpose uh, of maintaining these records is to ensure that they can be properly used in responding to legitimate questions and inquiries from Congress and from the public. Uh, and I understand that hundreds of documents have already been provided to Congress consistent with their specific request uh, out of these, uh, of these records. Well, that's actually what I wanted to ask you about. Okay. Trey, Trey Gowdy, on, uh, I think also on CBS this weekend, said that uh, in their request for uh, emails and documents from the State Department that there were big holes in uh, the Secretary's emails that were turned over. He cited specifically, you know, there's the famous photo of Hillary on her Blackberry flying to Libya and that there was no emails turned over not only from that day but that mm -hmm. trip entirely. So 
if those emails haven't been produced by the State Department, does that suggest that Secretary Clinton has not turned over all the emails that she should have? And if the principal investigator from Congress is saying that there are holes that exist in the record, is that something that you guys at the White House now need to step in and say, what's going on here? Let's investigate this. The State Department doesn't seem to be doing their job. Well, I, I don't, I'm not sure that there's, uh, I, I think that might be, that last part might be one step too far. It is the responsibility of the State Department to respond to legitimate requests from congressional committees. And the State Department has cooperated at great length with the eight different congressional committees that have been formed to investigate like the situation. Just turned over her email. So, and so, so I'm saying those, so those if you have, but, but my point is, is that if you or uh, Chairman Gowdy have specific questions about specific emails uh, that should be produced in uh, response to a legitimate congressional inquiry, then he should raise that directly with State Department officials. In fact, I would hazard a guess that if the White House were intimately involved uh, in that kind of effort to review email and uh, make determinations about uh, what should be provided to Congress, uh, that he'd be complaining about that on national television as well. So um, there is a process that's involved. And the point is, there is a strong track record of the State Department working closely with legitimate and even some illegitimate congressional inquiries into this particular matter. And um, so if he has questions or concerns uh, about that as the eighth uh, chairman of a committee to review this matter, uh, then he should take that up directly with the State Department. And this administration uh, will continue to be guided by a principle that we will work cooperatively with legitimate congressional inquiries. Okay, Ed. Uh, Josh, what is the timeline on when the White House Counsel's Office found out that Secretary Clinton had her own server at home. Mm -hmm. Ed, I, the, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, what I can tell you is that it is the responsibility of individual agencies to establish an email system and to make sure that those emails, as they're created, are properly archived and maintained, both so they can be used to respond to legitimate public inquiries and to legitimate congressional inquiries. And that's the responsibility of those agencies to do that is the agency at the State Department that specifically made the request to Secretary Clinton and her team uh, uh, to provide the uh, emails on her personal email system that relate to her uh, official government responsibilities. And when did the White House learn that not only that she had this other account or accounts, but that she had not turned them over to the previous committees? Was it when Trey Gowdy sent a subpoena or requested these documents? Is that the timeline? Well, Ed, again, I, I'm not, I, I don't know the answer to that specific question. Again, what I can tell you is that it is the responsibility of agencies to maintain these kinds of records, and it's the responsibility of agencies but at some point, to administer the email. the responsibility of the White House to make sure their Secretary of State is complying with at least rules, if not the law? And, and that is why the State Department made a specific request of Secretary Clinton and all of the previous Secretaries of State right. to ask them right. to turn over per emails on their personal email that may relate to the conduct of official U.S. government business. And that is uh, to ensure compliance with the Federal Records Act. Uh, and again, if Secretary Clinton's team did as they said they did, and nobody has raised in my mind at least uh, any legitimate reason to doubt that they've uh, done anything other than what they said they did, then Secretary Clinton is in compliance with the Federal Records Act. And on that point, Wall Street Journal quoting an administration official this morning is saying, quote, of the Clinton camp, if they screwed up on the emails, if we found out they skipped over her emails, and that will be a problem for them. It will be a scandal, but it's not one that will own. Is there some separation going on here between the White House and the Clinton camp? Well, uh, Ed, I, th I think the, that quote refers to a specific fact, which is that it's Secretary Clinton's team that is obviously has access to her personal email server, uh, and it's their responsibility to respond to the State Department request to turn over emails that were related to her official government business. Now, again, they say that they've done that, and I don't see any reason uh, to doubt that they have uh, done exactly what they said they would do. Uh, but ultimately, that is the responsibility of Secretary Clinton and her team. A couple other quick topics on Senator Menendez. Mm -hmm. um, when you were saying, you know, the, the key here is to make sure that investigations are not politicized, and this administration, as you know, has been very aggressive about investigating press leaks and whatnot. Are you launching some sort of investigation here to figure out why someone at the Justice Department 
leak the idea that a Democratic senator is about to face criminal charges. Well, and I can't speak to the accuracy of those claims, so I don't know. Well, they're published pretty widely. The claim, I mean, well, someone at the Justice Department that, was that, quoted. That's not, that's not proof of the, them being a fact. So, um, so they're misrepresented, and nobody at Justice talked to the media. I think the point is, Ed, that I am not aware uh, of anything like that, because I shouldn't be. That these are, uh, that if there is a criminal investigation underway, it is one that has been done wholly separate and apart from any sort of political interference. That's why I'm not in a position to comment on whether or not they're true or not. Okay, I well, don't know, so nor that, should I. And I think that's the point. And you're suggesting you don't know. Is, is there a firewall between the Justice Department and the White House on the Menendez investigation? Has the president been briefed on the potential Again, charge? No, no, it's just a simple question. Is anyone I, in the White I, House? And I'm making a simple point. I don't know if there's a Menendez investigation. You're, make, you're, you're referring to it as if it's a fact, okay. and I'm not in a position to so comment on it because I'm not aware nobody in the White House has been briefed by the Justice Department because you're not even aware that there's an investigation. Is that right? I am not aware that there is an investigation. And uh, the point is, is that we work very hard and diligently, as has previous administrations, to ensure for the integrity of these criminal, criminal investigations to move forward that there is not any political interference. Okay. And then last thing on Iran, um, you kept talking about sanctions and that what the Republicans want is war. And just reading Tom Cotton's letter, he, I don't see the word sanctions. I don't see the word war. Mm -hmm. I understand that that may be the way you're framing it, that they're pushing some alternative to go to war instead of a deal. But the letter actually goes into great detail about how what these Republicans at least claim that they want is they want to vote in Congress on the deal. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, what's wrong with a little sunshine? Why, what's wrong with saying, we're going to negotiate a wonderful deal here, and we're willing to let Democrats and Republicans vote on that? Mm -hmm. That appears to be, if you read their words, and I get you're going to read other motives and all this. The letter is saying we want an up or down vote in Congress. Right. Something Bob Menendez, a Democrat, we just talked about. He's wanted. Other yes. Democrats have talked about. He didn't sign what this is, letter. So he didn't sign this letter because the Republicans mm -hmm. did this. My question is, what's wrong with an up or down vote? They're not saying they don't want a deal. They're saying they want a deal that is going to survive an up or down vote on the Hill. That's different from what you're framing. <coughs> Senator Cotton has referred to his strategy to undermine this deal. Uh, as an effort to prevent a diplomatic agreement. He described that as a feature of his strategy, not a bug. I, I think he said it on camera. Uh, and so it is clear what their strategy is. And again, if they want to mask it as part of some sort of civics lesson that they want to share with Iran's political leadership, they're welcome to do that. It might evince some uh, reluctance uh, or at least hesitation about the wisdom of their strategy. Uh, or at least the wisdom of their ultimate goal here. And I think the reason for that is simple, Ed, because the only option to the sort of diplomatic, to a diplomatic <laughs> agreement that anybody else has raised is a military option. And again, we have seen Republicans time and again try to advance the military option ahead of a diplomatic option. And the President doesn't think that that's good uh, policy. He certainly doesn't think it's good strategy. And the truth is, you know, the, the efforts of neocons in the previous administration to do that, uh, frankly, uh, uh, hurt the country standing around the world. John. Josh, uh, first on the letter, uh, the letter says the next president could revoke such an agreement with the stroke of a pen and future congresses can modify the, term, the terms of an agreement at any time. I'm just wondering, is that an accurate statement? I mean, couldn't the next president, if this is not a ratified treaty, if this is simply an agreement that the president has struck with the leadership of Iran and our allies that uh, a future president can say, we're opting out? Well, John, I will tell you that one of the things that has contributed to the United States diplomatic influence around the globe is this notion of continuity. Uh, that when other countries are doing business with the leader of the United States, they understand that they're not just doing that business with one president, they're doing it with the country. Uh, and you know, for example, you know, on the campaign trail in 2008, there was no doubt about the fact that there was a substantial difference of opinion uh, between President Bush and President Obama for confronting a wide variety uh, of foreign policy challenges. And this president didn't walk into office uh, and with the stroke of a pen undo a whole long series of agreements that President Bush had reached with other countries, that would have been irresponsible. Uh, and in fact, you'll recall that the 
uh, debate throughout the 20, 2008 campaign was about a responsible drawdown of U.S. troops from Iraq. Uh, and um, you know, the fact is people around the globe understand that when they are doing business with uh, the American president, they're doing business with the United States of America and not just that one person. But isn't it true that history taken into consideration, isn't it true that the next president of the United States could undo this agreement with a stroke of a pen if it is not ratified by Congress? Well, again, it I... It may look bad, it may be something you think breaks with precedent, yeah. but would there be anything illegally that would stop the next president from undoing that agreement first day in office? Uh, if a president is focused on the best interests of the United States of America and focused on, uh, uh, on on the assessment of whether or not Iran is living up to the terms of the agreement, and if the international community has confirmed that they are, uh, it would clearly not be in the best interests of the United States. And it is hard to envision uh, a president taking an unprecedented step that only weakens the United States on his or her first day in office. Okay, uh, back to the question of uh, the emails. Um, given your, your back and forth on this question of you know, what, what Mrs. Clinton has turned over. Doesn't it make sense to have an independent arbiter look at her server and determine which emails were official business and therefore under the Records Act should be turned over uh, to the archives? I mean, doesn't it make sense that there should be a third party, an independent party to make that determination? Mm -hmm. Well, ultimately, as I mentioned before, Secretary Clinton's team has said that they have reviewed all these emails. Right. Uh, and they've turned over 55,000 of them to the State Department. So we're supposed to just take their word a, for it? a large number of them already existed on the State Department system. And I haven't heard anybody or seen anybody present any evidence to indicate that they didn't do what they said that they did. So, again, if they decide, uh, if Secretary Clinton's team decides that they want to uh, go to even greater lengths than they already have, then you know, that's ultimately a decision for them to make. They're the ones that are in charge of the email server. So you would uh, not have, you this would administration not have a problem. Is, the White House would not have a problem with a third party taking a look at her server and determining which emails were official uh, correspondence. Well, again, ultimately this is a decision that is going to be left up to uh, Secretary Clinton's team to make on this. But again, what we know is uh, we. I understand it's their. Okay. You're saying it's their decision to make, but you would have no objection to a third party looking at her server if that's what they decided to do to, to reassure everybody that she was completely above board. The White House would have no problem if a third party were to look at her server and determine which of her emails are official business and therefore well, should be. Again, I'd be surprised that that would be required. However, because no one has been in a position to provide any evidence to indicate that they haven't you actually done exactly. That would be required. You'd be surprised that people wouldn't want to take her word for it. Like it's an honor system. It's just whatever she determines is uh, is is official business. John, what's clear is that they have turned over thousands of records to the State Department. The State Department has properly archived and maintained them. They've already used them in response to questions that have been submitted by Congress. And no one at any point has suggested it, has suggested that Secretary Clinton's team. Uh, didn't turn over the emails that they were supposed to turn over, the ones that were related to the conduct of official business. Would it be strange for her to uh, not have any e emails from uh, a trip she took to the region where she's photographed on her BlackBerry? Uh, again, I, I, I can't speak to any emails that she may have sent uh, on this. Maybe she was using her BlackBerry to read the news. It's, uh, you can use your BlackBerry for other things other than email. Okay, right? and, and uh, on the Or tweeting, in fact. I think that's the whole joke, right, about the whole thing. Is text. That she was, it text. Oh, text from Hillary. Text from Hillary. Tweets yeah. from Hillary. Okay. Uh, well, maybe, maybe we can get into a whole other thing about her text. Let's not. We're, 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, on the question of, of the president, uh, the president was asked a very direct question by Bill Plant uh, if he was aware that she was using non-government email to conduct official business. Um, and his answer was he was not aware of that until he read the news or heard about it in the news reports. How is that possible if, as you just told us, he received emails from her? Because, I, I mean, by definition, wouldn't any email going from the Secretary of State to the President of the United States be, uh, be an official, you know, uh, business, official business? 
Well, uh, presumably, although, you know. I mean, it could have been a birthday, hello, how you yeah. doing, but, but uh, I mean, I would think just about so everything up. between those two Yeah, I, I tried to answer this uh, in response to somebody's question earlier, I think it was Justin's who brought this up the first time, um, that the president was referring specifically to the arrangement associated with Secretary Clinton's email. Yes, the president was aware of her email address. He traded emails with her. That shouldn't be a surprise that the President of the United States is going to trade emails with the Secretary of State. But the President was not aware of the fact that this was a personal email server uh, and that this was the email address that she was using uh, exclusively for all her business. Uh, all her business. Um, the President was not aware of that until um, that had been more widely reported. Uh, but again, the, the, the President's commitment to the guidance that we've offered to employees of the government to use official email for official business uh, is one that is important and one that he himself follows. Would the President, uh, if he had been aware, suggested to uh, Mrs. Clinton, Secretary Clinton, that she should be using official email since that was the guidance? Well, I, 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 that's a hard hypothetical to speculate upon. Thanks. Okay. Richard. Thank you, Josh. Uh, a couple of questions on the fight against ISIL. Um, last Friday, a uh, Canadian soldier with the uh, Special Operation was killed in a friendly fire incident. Um, I was just wondering first uh, how you see this uh, when we talk about a coordinated effort and strategy to fight ISIL. How come such incident happened? Mm -hmm. Richard, let me start by saying that the United States extends its deepest condolences on the loss of Canadian Armed Forces Sergeant Andrew Joseph Doiron, who was tragically killed in Iraq on Saturday during a friendly fire incident. We offer our sympathies to the people of Canada and to the family and loved ones of Sergeant Doiron. Our thoughts are also with the three injured members of the Canadian Armed Forces as we wish them a speedy recovery. The United States and more than 60 coalition partners proudly stand with Canada and recognize the extraordinary contributions and sacrifices of the Canadian Armed Forces and of all the men and women serving the coalition campaign to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. Uh, you know, obviously, as we have said and as you heard me observe on a number of occasions, uh, that uh, Iraq is a very dangerous place right now. Uh, and that is the reason that we've seen the international community uh, respond uh, under the leadership of this president uh, to try to um, support uh, Iraqi forces on the ground, Kurdish security forces on the ground, uh, as they try to roll back the gains that are made by ISIL. Uh, and it's very dangerous work, uh, and it is why we are so grateful of the contribution not just of the Canadian people and the Canadian military, uh, but of the uh, military resources that have come from coalition countries all around the globe. Part of the controversy, uh, Josh, and in Canada they are studying the possibility of renewing the mandate uh, of the soldiers over there. Um, is that the Canadian soldier, soldiers are doing airstrikes targeting on the ground. And um, the perception is they're doing this, the Americans are not on the ground doing it, taking big risks that the Americans are not taking uh, to make sure that, that these type of missions are prolonged. When will we see American soldiers doing this type of airstrike mm -hmm. targeting? Well, the, you know, this is a question that was raised uh, last fall for the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And so, in some ways, he's probably in the best position to uh, answer this question. I think that uh, American military personnel will start engaging in uh, that kind of uh, activity once the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff deems it necessary and makes such a recommendation to the United States that the President then uh, agrees with and approves. Uh, and that's the process that we have uh, established for this. This is an option that, as Chairman Dempsey has said in the past, uh, is on the table. Uh, my rough understanding, though, of the circumstances of the tragic incident that occurred over the weekend, though, is that it was not related to this, uh, to this issue of calling in airstrikes, that it was uh, in a different engagement in which uh, this tragedy occurred. April. Josh, on the ISIL issue. Boko Haram has pledged loyalty to uh, ISIS. What is the White House saying about that as they're still dealing with Boko Haram in uh, Africa, particularly in Nigeria? Mm -hmm. Well, April, we have seen reports of a Twitter message in a corresponding video purportedly from Boko Haram's leadership pledging allegiance to ISIL. The intelligence community has no reason to doubt that these claims were issued by Boko Haram's leader and may be designed at least in part for propaganda value. Boko Haram, which has previously expressed solidarity with both AQIM and Al-Qaeda Corps, and ISIL have demonstrated similar acts of wanton brutality 
and we take any potential links between these two groups as a matter of concern, the intelligence community will remain focused on potential indications uh, of deepening ties. Uh, you know, the, the, the part of this that I would uh, uh, commend to your attention is uh, the note that Boko Haram has previously sought to align themselves with other prominent uh, terrorist organizations. And it, uh, it might lead one at least to conclude that Boko Haram is primarily interested in the propaganda value of such an announcement. Um, and at this point, it's difficult to determine what sort of operational value it may have, but it's one that I'm confident the international community will be closely monitoring. On another subject, and I hate to do this back on the emails, um, when you talk about uh, the president's email, I'm sure there are security features and filters and things of that nature, but when he emails, I'm sure there, or you tell me if I'm right or wrong, you have to plug in a name or email so that the computer is, email system recognizes that person. You can't just send any kind of email to that system, meaning that it would recognize her .gov email account. Was it, I guess, programmed to accept that other server email as well? Uh, at this point, April, I, I'm not going to get into a, a detailed, uh, well, let me say it this way. One of the security precautions we take around the president's email is we don't talk about it very much publicly. Um, and well, <laughs> safety first. Uh, but you know, what I can tell you is that uh, the President and the Secretary of State uh, did exchange emails while she was serving as a Secretary of State. And uh, in accordance with the guidelines that we follow here at the White House, the, uh, that email was, uh, there, those exchanges were preserved pursuant to the Federal Records Act. And uh, you know, the other point that I would make on all of this, particularly as it relates to the President's email, is that uh, he himself has a keen awareness of how valuable when it comes to scholarly work that this email could be in the future. Uh, that previous presidents have not used the email nearly as much as he has. And uh, he understands that there is legitimate scholarly value in having uh, insight into those conversations that the president has over email with cabinet officials and uh, with other senior members of his administration. So uh, he certainly understands personally why this is important. You know, and that. Um, you know, over the weekend, the President had the opportunity to take uh, his daughters to the Library of Congress to see the written text of the President Lincoln's second inaugural address, that there's, um, that there's rich historical value in a document like that. Uh, and in some ways, um, you know, I, my guess is that the mundane day-to-day -day email that the President sends certainly wouldn't rise to the level of interest or eloquence of the second inaugural address that was delivered by President Lincoln. Uh, but it has an important scholarly value nonetheless, and the President recognizes that, and that's why he takes very seriously uh, the responsibilities that he has under the Presidential Records Act to ensure that those uh, records are properly maintained and archived. And, and my last question. Um, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu said this on CBS yesterday. He said the word uh, best deal when it comes to the Iran negotiations. The White House has said the word best deal, best deal. There are a lot of variables out there to create a best deal. What does the best deal look like when it comes to the negotiations with the world community with Iran? Well, uh, I think, April, for obvious reasons, I can't get into a lot of detail about that. This is something that's currently being negotiated. But what, as a principle, I can tell you that what the administration is seeking to do uh, is to ensure that, at a minimum, the breakout time for Iran is expanded to one year. We know that experts right now uh, estimate that Iran's breakout period uh, is around two to three months. This is The breakout period refers to the time in which uh, Iran would essentially throw off international monitoring and inspections uh, and run headlong toward, a, toward developing a nuclear weapon. Right now, that's something that they could achieve in just two or three months if you listen to what some public experts have, have – or if you listen to what some experts have said publicly. Uh, under the terms of this negotiation, uh, we would ensure that the breakout period was expanded to a year. Now, in addition to that, what we would insist upon is that Iran commit to comply with a historically intrusive set of inspections. And in the mind of the President, and I think in the mind of people who are willing to take uh, a nonpartisan look at this, that is the best way for us to resolve our concerns about Iran's nuclear program, that we can push the breakout period to a year, 
substantially lengthen it, uh, and impose an intrusive set of inspections that would verify Iran's compliance with the agreement. Uh, the wisdom of this is that if we determine that Iran is somehow not living up to the terms of the agreement, then the President will continue to have the full range of options on the table. Uh, additional sanctions, additional coordinated steps with the international community, or yes, even the military option, is that if that's the one that we have to resort to. But this underscores the difference in approach uh, between Democrats uh, or the President uh, and congressional Republicans. Congressional Republicans are ready to fast forward to the, to the military approach uh, before the diplomatic approach, diplomatic approach has been given the opportunity to succeed. And uh, that, again, sort of reflects, uh, is consistent with the pattern of foreign policy decision making that Republicans have been engaged in over the last uh, decade or two. It's also an approach that has been roundly, uh, you know, roundly uh, criticized by the international community. Uh, it did lead to uh, the diminishment of the U.S. standing on the international scene. It also is, is an approach uh, that's not been supported by the American public. And ultimately, uh, that's the approach that, um, and ultimately that is sort of the measure that uh, we would want um, our political leaders to do. All right, Peter. Josh, just hours after President Obama finished his remarks commemorating, uh, at Selma, commemorating an event that is seared in the history of the civil rights movement in this country, an ugly video came out of the University, uh, Oklahoma University. It showed uh, some students using racial epithets. The fraternity that they belong to has now been kicked off campus. The president um, has come out and adamantly spoken out against this. I'm curious if the president is aware of it, the president has thoughts on it, and just what this White House has taken uh, is on it. Uh, I've not spoken to the president about this specific issue, but I certainly, uh, on behalf of everybody here at the White House, we would certainly welcome the steps that were uh, announced both by the president of the university as well as uh, the steps that were taken by the national organization to, uh, to, to completely repudiate uh, the comments that were included in that video. Um, and that certainly is, uh, is an appropriate step. Uh, quickly, just going back to Hillary Clinton and the email. So right now, obviously, she said, as the president said, I should say, he said, I'm glad that Hillary's instructed that those emails about official business need to be disclosed. But is that a satisfactory bar, or does the president want, or is this White House asking for some better explanation of why she was, in fact, using this private server when the rules or perhaps the law indicates that that's not the system that should have been used? Mm -hmm. Well, what the, what the administration, at least when this regard is focused on, is uh, living up to the standard of transparency that this uh, administration, this president, has set. Uh, and that includes uh, ensuring that government records are properly archived, maintained, at least consistent with uh, the Federal Records Act. And President Clinton's, Secretary Clinton's team has reviewed her personal email uh, and forwarded the ones uh, pertaining to her official work as a Secretary of State to the State Department so that they could be properly archived and maintained. Do you have faith that all the ones that had any relationship to the questions being posed have been provided. Well, again, that is what Secretary Clinton's team has said that they have done, and I haven't seen anybody produce any evidence to indicate that they have fallen short of what they said they were going to do. Thanks, okay. Josh. Mark. Josh, how did the White House play a role in the decision to raise the reward offered for the return of Robert Levinson mm -hmm. to $5 million, as the FBI did today? Mm -hmm. uh, Mark, I, I can't uh, speak to any uh, uh, specific conversations that may have taken place between the White House and the FBI. Uh, if we're able to do that, I'll have somebody follow up with you. But uh, you point out that today is the eighth anniversary of Mr. Levinson's uh, disappearance, and um, you know this it serves as a useful reminder of how uh, many concerns the United States continues to have uh, about uh, Iran and their conduct in a wide variety of areas. That the that there, uh, we have for eight years now been seeking information from the Iranian government about the details surrounding Mr. Levinson's disappearance. We have also uh, sought agreement from the Iranian government to release those Americans who are unjustly detained uh, in Iran. We've also expressed concerns with uh, Iran's support for terrorism around the globe and with their anti-Semitic threats against our closest ally in the region. So we have a long list of concerns uh, about Iran and their behavior, and those concerns aren't going to go away. Uh, even if we are able to reach a negotiated solution uh, or at least a negotiated uh, commitment from Iran to try to bring their 
a nuclear program into compliance with generally accepted international standards. Uh, we're going to continue to have those concerns. And frankly, in the mind of the President, the fact that we have this long list of concerns is the reason it's so important for us to resolve our concerns about Iran's nuclear program, that a nuclear-armed Iran would only be able to more um, um, hostilely menace our closest ally in the region. Uh, that Iran developing a nuclear weapon and, and acquiring a nuclear weapon will make it harder for us to get uh, Americans who are unjustly detained inside of Iran home. And uh, Iran detaining, uh, obtaining a nuclear weapon uh, only makes their support for terrorism around the globe more dangerous. So the stakes are high, uh, and uh, uh, certainly the uh, occasion of the eighth anniversary of Mr. Levinson's disappearance uh, is an appropriate time for us to acknowledge that. Has the Levinson matter been brought up in the uh, P5 plus one talks? What we have said, Mark, is that we have raised uh, these broader concerns with the Iranians on the sidelines of these talks. Uh, we do not envision a scenario where uh, discussions about, um, uh, about Americans held in Iran or Mr. Levinson's disappearance to become uh, a specific part of the P5 plus one negotiations. Uh, but because this is a priority for the United States and for this administration, securing the safe return of Mr. Levinson and other Americans held in Iran, we have on the sidelines of those talks uh, engaged with our Iranian counterparts to let them know that we consider this a priority and that we'd like to get that information about Mr. Levinson's disappearance, and we would like for those individuals that we already know are being held in Iran released. And how is offering a, a reward different from paying a ransom? Well, uh, I guess that would be a question for the FBI, um, but ultimately, presumably, the uh, payment of information would go to uh, somebody who could help you find the individual who is missing uh, and would not be paid to the individual who is uh, holding that person captive. Okay? All right. Uh, Mike, I'll give you the last one. Uh, when you talk about a pattern on the part of Republicans of undermining the President's ability to conduct foreign policy, I'm wondering what other examples you might offer that would fit that pattern. I mean, you've talked about the, uh, obviously the invitation, uh, the protocol involved with the Netanyahu invitation, but what other examples would you offer? Well, that we've seen other comments. I, I did inv in include, uh, I did have in mind the sort of end run that we saw House Republicans uh, uh, engage in, in terms of uh, circumventing the administration and uh, unilaterally inviting the Israeli Prime Minister to speak at, uh, to a, a joint meeting of the United States Congress. The other thing that I have in mind are the uh, repeated criticisms and efforts to undermine um, a, an agreement that has not yet even been reached. Uh, that that kind of um, criticism from Republicans is a distortion uh, of a deal, again, that doesn't even exist. So what this administration envisions is an opportunity for us to try to continue to work cooperatively with Congress in this endeavor. In this endeavor. It's, yielded, it's yielded fruit so far, that we have succeeded in putting in place a sanctions regime on Iran that has compelled them to the negotiating table, that we have succeeded in having extensive conversations between senior administration officials and leaders in Congress, uh, frankly, without the details of those conversations leaking publicly. That reflects some goodwill and some good faith. Uh, and it, the, the administration is not just having those conversations with Democrats, we're having them with Republicans too. So it does mean that there are at least some members of Congress who are willing to contribute to this constructively. Uh, but writing a letter like this uh, that uh, appeals to the hardliners in Iran uh, is frankly just the latest in an ongoing strategy, a partisan strategy to undermine the President's ability to conduct foreign policy and to advance our interests around the globe. And that's um, I think that ex that's the explanation for, um, I think, what you could accurately describe as a pretty um, forceful response to the letter today. When, when Democrats won back the control of the House and the Senate in 2006, obviously in 2007 there were a number of efforts made to um, you know, put limits on the, the fighting in Iraq to cut, cut off funding, and the President was a senator and part of that uh, majority in the Senate at the time. I'm wondering how you draw the line between the usual give and take between the branches here and what you're calling a, a pattern here on the part of Republicans. Well, I think what I would say about this, Mike, and that you do raise, this is one point that I've not had the opportunity to make, despite the fact that I've been talking a lot today, that there is something interesting about the pattern here, which is that the administration fully believes 
that there is a legitimate and even an important role for Congress to play when it comes to foreign policy. Uh, and I mean this even outside of the Iran context. I've sort of talked a number of times now about sort of the role that we believe Congress should play, both in the run-up to, in the midst of these conversations, and ultimately the role that they will play down the line uh, in, uh, in removing sanctions against Iran. But there are other ways that Congress can and should um, uh, be a part of foreign policy. And the, the best example I can think of right now is the authorization to use military force. The President has sent up language to Congress asking for Democrats and Republicans to come together around a strategy to establish a, uh, uh, a specific, specific authorization um, that does not overly constrain the ability of the Commander in Chief to conduct foreign policy, but does ensure that Congress has a voice in making that decision. The common thread, at least between the, this Iran situation and the AUMF, is that we see a Republican Party that is eager to um, uh, direct almost unlimited authority to the President of the United States to wage war, but to try to repeatedly tie his hands when he's trying to conduct diplomacy. And that is the nature of the conflict that we see right now, is you have a President of the United States that is seeking to advance our national security interests around the globe using diplomacy, by using our influence around the world to build international coalitions to protect our interests and to protect the American people. The President finds that approach uh, not just more effective, but one that has yielded important uh, results for the American people. The coalition that we built against ISIL is a great example of that, that there are airstrikes that are being conducted uh, against ISIL, uh, and there are uh, fighters who are taking the fight on the ground to ISIL to roll back their gains. Uh, but those, th that fight on the ground is being led by Iraqi security forces and Kurdish security forces that are fighting for their own country. They're doing so in close coordination uh, with Sunni tribal fighters as well, and that reflects the kind of political strategy that the President wholeheartedly endorses in Iraq. Uh, but the, the role for the United States is one that's limited to military airstrikes and limited to some train, advise, and assist uh, efforts. Um, but the point is that the reason that we're having this conversation and this debate, in fact, is because there is a starkly different approach between the one that's advocated by Republicans that puts uh, the military option in war fighting at the top of the list. That is not an approach that the vast majority of the American public supports, and it's certainly not an approach that our recent history indicates is the best way to protect American national security interests. The best way for us to protect the United States, our citizens, and our interests around the globe is to work cooperatively with nations uh, around the globe and seek to advance our interests in multilateral fashion. We did that in destroying chemical weapons in Syria. Uh, we've done that in trying to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. And the President uh, is in the midst of an effort to do that as it comes when it comes to one of the most important national security challenges that we have right now, which is resolving the international community's concerns with Iran's nuclear program. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good Monday.